Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today. Uh, the webinar today is Creating the Learning Experience. It's a new way of delivering learning. My name is Brett Wilson, and I'm a practice lead in Cornerstone's Thought Leadership and Advisory Services team. I came to Cornerstone a little over four years ago. My job is twofold. I partner with clients in terms of their learning strategy and help them find that intersection of business goals and talent strategy and, and also to help them get the most out of our platform. And I also lead a team of experienced consultants that bring a wealth of uh, knowledge uh, and experience across all talent management areas. There's nine of us uh, with a combined experience that exceeds 150 years in the HR field. Now what's expected of us is to monitor what's happening in HR. Uh, we do the deep research, uh, we stimulate ideation and come up with what we call next practices. Uh, and we, pro we promote our point of view in writing and in social contexts like this, like this webinar. So let me start with what I call the big assertion. As you all know, every year Cornerstone hosts a large conference called Convergence. This year it was held in San Diego. And our CEO, Adam Miller, in his keynote, he spent a lot of time showing us how our platform, specifically the learning platform, has been transformed into more of a user experience, much like the way we consume TV at home or on multiple devices. It's got that consumerized effect and look and feel. And also at Convergence, he had a discussion, an onstage discussion with Josh Burson. Uh, Josh is a leading expert and analyst in the talent management area. And one of the things Josh said, uh, and this is the big assertion, was that the new Cornerstone learning platform will likely change corporate learning market. Now, I'm not here to sell you anything, but I do want to explore with you how consumer electronics is helping to shape how we approach learning, how it's less about delivery and more about the learning experience or the learner experience. And I think the current learning landscape is about as dynamic as the Internet itself. Arguably, the LMS is turning into the experience platform, and it needs to support the shift from instructional design to experience design. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen this gentleman, Sir Ken Robinson. Uh, he had a TED Talk. And it was the most viewed TED Talk ever. And if you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to, to watch it. In his talk, he describes how our modern educational system uh, continues to stifle creativity in our kids, because it still largely operates as it did in the late 19th century. At that time, it was the industrial age. And people worked in factories. And the whole idea of the educational system was that you know we needed to push kids through school and largely a one-size-fits-all, so eventually work in the factories. And those jobs were generally menial and very routine. Now, I'm not an education system reformist, so not, I'm really not in a position to uh, argue one way or the other, but I do think Robinson's premise is correct. And because well, the world has changed since the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, specifically in the form of technology and the way we do work, uh, I think it's something we need to be thinking about in L&D, uh, something that we need to be mindful of, that the world has changed and we need to do, uh, adjust. And one of the things that has happened is the very nature of work. Now, this kind of busy chart uh, is basically saying that there are more, the, the rise of the non-routine, both manual and cognitive jobs continues to rise, largely due to technology. And that um, is just a reality. And, and the fact that we, specialized skills have become actually more important, a lot of them being soft skills around decision-making skills. And individuals are more autonomous and empowered to work for themselves. So a lot's changed since the early days when the educational system was conceived. So when we look at it of where we've been, it first started in the classroom. Um, and this chart 
uh, illustrates the five stages of learning. And in this slide summarizes what Jane Hart's position is, and Jane's the founder of the Center for Learning and Performance Technologies. And her position is that workplace learning has progressed through five stages. First, classroom training. Uh, then came e-learning. Then came blended learning, a combination of both. Social learning, and then finally collaborative learning. Starting with the classroom training you see on the, the left, the, the horizontal bar, each stage gradually moves away from a top-down control dictated by the organization to more of a bottom-up control where, where employees drive learning. Hart says we're currently in the fourth stage with social learning, the, the theory that people learn through observation and socialization. Uh, well, actually, I, I, you know, I disagree. I think we're at the fifth stage, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And she says that true innovation requires moving to the final stage of collaborative learning. And I agree with her there because the integration of technology has changed the world of work. People collaborate now across time zones, different industries, different skill sets. But I don't view this as a linear progression, per se. We, we still use all of these modalities. And there's no reason why we won't continue to use these methods. But it's the collaborative learning piece that does present interesting things to think about. So what is collaborative learning? Now, Hart tells us that it's, it's learning that happens in the flow of work. I love that phrase, in the flow of work. It's enabled, supported. It's encouraged. It's not designed or managed. Um, and ultimately, collaborative learning allows learning and work not only to be interdependent, but unified. And it goes beyond the social learning premise that we, as people, learn more by sharing and work with in workplace interactions with others. It's how, you know, in the case of Cornerstones Connect, it puts us in an environment where, where we're, we are free to challenge ourselves and challenge others and get different perspectives from our peers. So let's talk a little about this whole concept of informal learning. There's been a lot of research on the 70-20-10 model. It basically asserts that our learning uh, will be about 70% from on-the-job experiences, working on tasks, uh, solving problems, about 20% from feedback and observation, and about 10% from formal courses and reading. Put simply, formal learning, and when I say that, I'm talking about in the classroom, e-learning, webinars like this, seminars, conferences, books, really represents a small percentage of what we learn. It's 10%, and in the, in the balance, 90% we learn informally. So it's important to leverage social tools like Connect to harness as much of that 90% learning potential as we can. And research, the 87% the, the on the left is really the data from a study uh, survey that Burson uh, did uh, across 1,500 people, and it basically says 87% of, of those responding uh, felt that sharing knowledge was essential to learning, um, uh, so clearly it's important. And in another study, 84% said we'd be more than happy to use technology to help us do just that. And it matches a study that Jane Hart did, and it, from, and it was documented in her article, Our Search and Social ousting learning, uh, but it's, it's a survey of 3,500 people across 54 countries. And note, knowledge sharing with your team ranked highest of importance. It's a little troubling that e-learning was the lowest. That's one of the reasons why uh, we're, we, Cornerstone, are making these investments and we're looking through the user, user experience lens when it comes to learning. We have to. You know, 90% of what we learn, we learn informally. And overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, learners are telling us we want to collaborate, and we, we now have the tools to make that happen. So with that as a backdrop, the real purpose of the webinar here today is I wanted to give you uh, a diagnostic process and provide you some solutions that you can employ in your shop. And it's really a three-step process. Uh, I think you can replicate these tools quite easy when you see them. Uh, but it's to diagnose, identify the gaps, uh, and describe how content and the community play new roles in the learning platform. So, before I do that, let me start with a story. 
I call this story Tippingness, which is about how we approach learning today, but should hopefully tip learning in the future, a more consumer-like experience, and inspire learners to remember what we teach them. So here's this, <coughs> here's this story. There's a gentleman by the name of Art Silverman, and he works for the Center of Science in the Public Interest, and that's a, a nonprofit group that educates the public about nutrition. And about 10 years ago, he decided to take on the challenge of alerting the movie-going public that the theater popcorn is bad for you. It's actually one of the most unhealthy things to eat, specifically theater popcorn, because it's loaded with saturated fats. In essence, a single serving of popcorn had 37 grams of saturated fat. Most of this fat comes from coconut oil. And the reason theaters use coconut oil is because it has that very pleasant, appealing smell to it. You know, ooh, I walk in the theater, I smell the popcorn. And the idea is they like it because it draws more customers to buy popcorn. Now, the USDA recommends that a normal diet contain no more than 20 grams of saturated fat per day. Now, Art's a pretty academic guy, and he, you know, as a member of the Center of Science in the Public Interest, um, and he used that as his pulpit to get the word out yelling from the rooftops, hey, don't eat movie popcorn. It's got 37 grams of saturated fat. But nobody really listened, or it didn't really resonate with people because he said 37 grams, gee, is that bad? I mean, I'm, I don't connect it with anything. Um, uh, you know, by itself, does it really stop me from uh, buying popcorn at the theater? So he took a different approach. And then he said he changed his message from using a rather dry academic, you know, 25 grams versus 37 grams, and he put pictures to it, comparing a bag of popcorn to three, frankly, fatty, unhealthy meals. You know, the bacon and eggs, no, I like bacon and eggs, but the Big Mac fries and the Coke and capped off at dinner with a steak and a loaded baked potato. Um, and, and prior to that, this picture, nobody had context of what 37 grams of unsaturated fat meant. So his new message was to show these pictures to the world and say that one bag of popcorn has more saturated fat than these three meals put together. It's pretty cool what happened after that. So what did all that have to do with learning? Well, with some focus and care, Art was sending a message that theater popcorn is bad for you, educating them so maybe theater goers or theater owners would change their behavior. In essence, what's the tipping point? Given where we're going with learning, that is going to more of a learning experience, we have to be able to influence behavior and know what that tipping point is. And you want it to stick. In the case of learning, it's about moving away from a static LMS approach to a more experiential and effective way of learning. There's a great book by Malcolm Gladwell called The Tipping Point. And it's the name of my story. It was the number one bestseller internationally and the kind of book that really gets people thinking, particularly in the field of marketing. But it also has real value to the world of learning. He describes how there are three components to making a movement or getting to that tipping point, influencing the behavior or attitudes of people. Anyway, the three components are the law of the few, the stickiness factor, and the power of context. Now, what I found interesting is that any, and anybody who's read the book, I think, would see the same thing. Uh, he said very specific about the law of the few and the power of context. What's fascinating is that he's very vague about the stickiness factor. In fact, He's admitting, as you see in the quote, um, uh, that he really doesn't know the magic formula around how to make uh, the experience sticky. When you think about learning, you want your training programs to be sticky. Or if you want to train people to do things a certain way, you have to get them to a point where it's a new behavior. So and is what Gladwell says, there's a simple way to package information that, under the right circumstances, can make it irresistible. All you have to do is find it. Thanks, Captain Obvious. And that's literally the last set, uh, sentence in the chapter about the stickiness factor. <laughs> so 
that's not really very operational for us uh, because we want to go from a static LMS-centric approach to a more experiential approach. And I was talking about this to a colleague of mine, and he told me about another book titled Made to Stick. And the authors of the book, Chip and Dan Heath, wrote it because Malcolm Gladwell kept us all hanging. So they wrote this to get to the finish line around the stickiness factor. And as they say, this is a book uh, complement to the tipping point in the sense that we will identify traits that make ideas sticky, a subject that was beyond the scope of Gladwell's book. So here's what they did. Uh, they created a framework. It's called success. It's, it has six characteristics. And if you want to sell something or have people learning something, it needs to be sticky. And these are the six guiding principles. It's got to be simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional, and it needs to tell a story. So now we have this framework that we can overlay our learning experience, both from a learning strategy standpoint and a content standpoint. So let me begin with that. So let me walk you through uh, these principles. And I promise you, you'll see how they apply in a few slides. And I want you to use these, or feel free to use these, uh, uh, as tools. Let's start with the first principle of making something sticky so people will remember it. It starts with making a simple yet profound statement in your learning experience, like, ooh, that got my attention. Great example is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Simple, compact, very clear. The next is, are your learning positions or statements unexpected? It's something that is usually different than what most people would expect. It's counterintuitive. It's, wow, one bag of popcorn is more unhealthy than eating three fatty meals in a day? It's something that you'll want to grab. Remember, this is also, it gets to the point where people are actually changing their behavior, and it's, it's certainly become sticky. Next is, are they concrete? We have to use solid language, but something that is, is explainable, something that will stay in people's heads. An example might be, instead of saying, having a good opportunity is better than speculating on a future one. You know, a better way to say that might be, uh, a bird in hand is worth two in the bush, which basically means that it's better to hold on to something one already has than to risk losing it by trying to get something better. See what I mean? Next one is, are your positions credible? We tend to use statistics and charts thinking that will make our messages more credible. Well, to some extent it is, but in point of fact, they won't help as much as you think. A great example of making your point credible is something I, I thought of the other day, and, and many of you may not be old enough to remember this. In fact, probably most of you. But this is back in the uh, 80s when Ronald Reagan ran against Jimmy Carter. Now, instead of, and, this, and the whole theme of that election was really about uh, economics. Inflation was high, and Reagan promised to come in and save the day. And rather than throw up charts and figures and graphs to explain his economic model, he simply asked the voters, are you better off today than you were four years ago? What that did is it, it gave people freedom to have a reflective moment, much more credible, uh, because people were able to satisfy for themselves. In this example, Reagan comes off very credibly. Now, in the next one, we as people, we think rationally. Um, and when we think rationally, we tend to feel less empathetic. And when people feel less emotion, they're less likely to act. So emotions are a much bigger driver of behavior. For example, um, Nike's Just Do It campaign. Now, Nike sells shoes, but the message goes to the consumer, and the consumer feels an emotional attachment to staying in shape. Another one's Under Armour's I Will What I Want campaign. You want to power the, uh, or harness the power of association. A big one is De Beers' Diamonds Are Forever. Uh, it, it basically sells the idea that diamond rings aren't just jewelry. It's the ultimate symbol of love. So, and then finally, storytelling. Uh, the reason storytelling is so powerful, it's, it's not only entertaining, but, that, but there's a neurological component to it. Stories actually have uh, the neurological effect of connecting both the left and the right sides of the brain. The right side of our brain is where we do our abstract thinking, and the left, it, left side is more linear, the, the get things done side. 
And because storytelling connect the two sides of the brain, it's easier to remember it. It's easy to retrieve that information. And we want our learning to have a story because it enables recall so much more effectively. Now let's talk about some other solutions. And I think this is important to understand just using learning as a backdrop. If you look at the full life cycle of talent management, and I'm not just talking about talent, you know, uh, uh, software. I'm talking about the talent management processes, people interactions, um, that kind of thing. Learning is the only area that allows you to change. The other areas are more like stages in the full life cycle that move you, designed to move you from a current state to a desired state. Let me illustrate. Let's say you're somebody who is pursuing a job at ABC Corporation. And your current state is you don't yet work for the company, but your desired state is to become an employee. And while you were trying to do that, you studied the company uh, and you learned about the jobs. You may have gone to Glassdoor to see about the culture. All the while, you're learning about ABC Corporation. And from a recruiting standpoint, ABC, uh, they, they, they're trying to make sure that, you, that, that the experience for you is a good one. So then ABC hires you. Now you're in the desired state of becoming a, of being an employee. Your next, your next journey is to onboarding, which uh, takes you from being just an employee to the desired state of being a productive employee. It not only helps teach you about your role and the culture of the company and what are the resources available to you, but it's really the catalyst of change going from an employee to the desired state of being a productive employee. And now that I'm productive, I don't want to just be average, I want to be stellar. I want to take advantage of every tool that I've got, including additional learning resources, and could be courses on the LMS, could be coaching, but as we learned, we get most of our learning informally. So in my journey of development, I leverage learning to make the change to my desired state of becoming a stellar employee. So I'm doing well, I'm a stellar guy, and I go for my annual performance review, and I tell my boss, look at how great I'm doing. And she tells me, yep, you're sure stellar, all right. But in order to remain that way, you need to have some more training because I want to take you to the next role. I want, to promote, I want to promote you. So we have to teach you things you probably don't know yet. Once again, I'm going through a change and I'm learning. And you see the theme here. The one static component is learning, and it's leveraged throughout the life cycle of taking you from a current state to a desired state. And that's, that's important for the slides that follow here. So let's apply this. We're going to do three things. I'm going to show you an approach, a process to diagnose where you are today. And you have to kind of know where your current state is before you can plot your desired state. Then I'll show you in a simple, in a simple way, I hope, to figure out where the gaps are and methods where you, where you can determine solutions to, to support the learner's experience. Uh, then we're going to talk about ways you can enhance that experience through the use of content uh, and social community type learning activities. So let's get started. All right, how do I figure out current state? You recognize these, these six guiding principles that I talked about? Well, they're the guiding principles of stickiness, and this is how we use them in our framework. We start by asking ourselves reflective questions. Uh, and let's start with the simple principle. The first thing I may ask myself from an experiential learner's perspective, is content easy to find? Uh, is that content pertinent to my job? Is it useful? Is it relevant? When thinking about how you affect learning at your company, be reflective and honest and ask these questions about your current landscape. Uh, make it easy. Use a yes, no, true, false, whatever. This is a hypothetic, hypothetical uh, example, folks, so you want to tailor it and make your list pertinent to, to uh, your shop. Uh, try not to be ambiguous by adding a third category, you know, keep it yes, no, true, false. And remember, the intent of this is to identify gaps that stand in your way uh, to getting to your desired state. So in this example, um, is it easy to find things? Yeah, that's true. Is the content connected to the job? Well, not always, but that's a place I've got to look, so I put an X. 
And you get, you know, is it unexpected? Is it memorable? Yeah. Is it thoughtful? Nah, I'm not sure about that. Is it captivating? Absolutely. So you kind of follow these patterns, be it on your strategy or even down to a specific curriculum. And again, you're being reflective and you're being honest. And, and there is no category in my view of kind of. If, you, if the answer is kind of, then it's an area you need to investigate at a, at a future point here, the, at the next juncture of our tool. So, filling the gaps. Where you, this, is, this is the same chart, but I added a third column for mitigation. Uh, uh, note that this is still a hypothetical example, but I put an A next to those inventory items that I determined to be okay already, <clears throat> but put in a simple step to consider if it's an area that help is needed. So uh, this way you're just, it's just an efficient way to use your time so you can focus on the areas that you need, that you determined earlier need some help. So start with simple. In larger companies, content libraries get huge. I, I always use the analogy of it's like buying a house and the garage is empty and you can get your car in it and over time you can't even fit your car in there anymore and it's so cluttered you can't find anything. Well, when you look at your content library, you may have tons of content about the job. You just don't know how to find it. So you want to build taxonomies where searching will be successful. Uh, go the next step, align the content so that it's predictive, just like Amazon. You know, people who bought this also bought that. On the next category, does it have the unexpected component? If it doesn't, it won't be sticky. It's got to be memorable. Um, you know, in this example, maybe you can use gamification, but you're asking yourself, is it learner-oriented? Is it learner-friendly? Uh, an example might be sales training uh, where sales folks are on the road all the time. And, you know, you have to look at things and say, well, can they take this training? Is it formatted correctly for my phone? If it's not, they're not going to take the training. But also ask yourself other questions around the learning experience. How long are the videos? The same example, they're not going to watch an hour-long video on their phone. In today's, uh, in today's life, I, it's arguable many people would watch a learning or training-related video that's an hour long anywhere. So um, uh, if you teach a class and to tell the students, uh, this is along the lines of, being, of putting mystery into your theme. If you teach a class and tell your students, kind of the punchline at the beginning, the summary level, you stand a good chance they're not going to pay attention and hang with you throughout. Uh, it's kind of like the popcorn story. I bet you're curious how that ended, too. Um, next category is your learning content concrete. Does it have a purpose? If you're teaching a sales effectiveness course, for example, and your stated purpose is sales techniques to increase shareholder value, well, that has no meaning to me as a salesperson, if, if that were rewritten to where the purpose is to reduce sales cycles from 90 to 60 days, now that's, that's more meaningful to me. It describes the end, end results using concrete terms. Now, my academic background is adult learning, and one of the things that remains sticky for me to this day uh, and how my professors, you know, use these principles, uh, it was the subject of differentiating training content from learning content. And if, example, let's say I'm an engineer and I design diesel engines, I need to learn about metallurgy, heat transfer, heat transfer fuel compounds, lots, lots of complicated things. On the other hand, if I'm a, a mechanic of that engine, it'd be nice to learn all that stuff. But really what I need to learn is how to, how to fix the engine when it breaks. So the stickiness part of this that I use all the time is understand the difference between uh, training content and educational for the sake of educational content. And that, uh, I'm sure, will help you as well when you're thinking of language and the intent of your learning to make sure that your statements are concrete. Uh, is it credible? It's important to audit the credibility of your content library. You need to ask yourself, is it current? Is it relevant? Is it up to date? <clears throat> I recently saw this cartoon that said uh, basically 10 years ago, uh, we were taught to never communicate with strangers on the Internet, and ever since we were kids, we were always taught to never get in cars, strangers' cars. Now in 2017, we ru routinely summons people from the Internet that we don't even know so we can get in their cars and go somewhere. So look at your content. 
Make sure that it's current. Make sure that it's relevant. Um, the emotional factor. Usually, this is not something you embed uh, in your content, uh, but it usually is connected to a sense of importance, especially with experiential learning. You want to tie the purpose of your learning to something that can have some kind of emotional tie. Um, but you want to have that tie in a way that it, it, it sticks with your learners. For example, instead of saying that I'm taking uh, this CPR course because the company policy requires me to do so, maybe it'd be I'm taking the CPR course because, you know, I might be able to save lives if called to do so. And that puts an emotional tie, and your adoption rate of your learning will go up as well. Finally, the story. Always start with a story. I don't know if you noticed I weaved a story into this webinar. And as long as I attach to that story, it should be more memorable for you. And I know this approach, and overall, these six things, this approach is the basis of your strategy to move from your current to your desired state of learning in your organization. And I know you're probably curious about what happened to the, you know, with the popcorn story. Don't worry, I'll get to it. All right, let's put this into practice. Now that we understand the principles of stickiness and a process to diagnose where you are and the steps that you need to take, let's talk about how we use them to move to a better learner experience. Again, using the same model. An example of keeping it simple would be using short videos or some other form of micro learning. That might be your answer. The point being that since technology affects our lives so much, we have shorter attention spans. So you want to be mindful to have content that can be consumed in bursts, fewer than 10 minutes. Uh, it's like a book. Your curriculum may have many chapters, but keep it consumable. Let, let's use the course titled How to Reduce Your Sales Cycle from 90 to 60 Days. And let's say you designed the course and found it to be three hours worth of content. Well, then have a lot of chapters. If you're, you know, if you're using Cornerstone Connect, the social component, um, Post your learning in a way that a group or a cohort could get to it. When done well, our experience is that people will contribute their ideas, questions. It just kind of organically grows in value. Now, an, an example of applying the unexpected principle could be saying something provocative about your learning subject. I mean, in this case, reduce sales cycles from 90 to 60 days. You may want to post up and connect. Uh, by the way, you being a learning and development person. You might want to post something like, research shows that salespeople that don't take this training are 50% more likely to get into a car crash. Now, I know that's silly, but it's memorable. It's certainly unexpected, right? It's some, it's, you can have some fun with it, and it should be thoughtful. So properly posted, it might read, our data shows that those who took this training made 50% more in commissions than those that didn't. You get the picture, but it's important. You want it memorable. So be provocative. The next concrete are the words right. Vocabulary is everything, folks. Again, this is where using the social components of Connect are very useful. State the purpose of the learning clearly and concisely and in a post, and then maybe trail it with a question, you know, uh, and see what the reactions. Again, that it, it, it becomes intrinsically more valuable when people contribute to that post. And a good way to keep the learning content credible is to properly source it. Get your data from credible material. It also needs to be up to date. Again, back to the Uber cartoon. You know, 10 years ago, we were taught to be careful about communicating with people you don't know on the Internet and never get in a stranger's car. Today, we, use, we do that routinely. So you'll want to examine the currency of your library. So like that example, you know it's up to date. And I always recommend to my clients, uh, to the customers, that you should do a content audit at least annually to ensure it's credible. Now, you really can't instill content as it relates to emotional stickiness. It's better to share an emotional experience that you had. For example, uh, like the, the Nike and De Beers examples from earlier, uh, you, know, you ought to be able to share an experience that you know of. Now, for example, Cornerstone has a foundation from the very beginning in 1999. Uh, it was our founders felt very strongly that they had a commitment to give back to the community. So the foundation today 
provides free software and services. An example is a program called Disaster Ready. It's the largest provider of training for workers and volunteers to be ready for a disaster. Another example for me that comes to mind is when I went through onboarding here at Cornerstone, uh, we spent a day uh, helping local underprivileged kids build skateboards. Just a grown up to a kid, let's, let's figure this out. And that, that's an emotional attachment to me. Uh, that makes me feel good. Uh, and, and, you know, think in those terms when you're talking about learning opportunities. And finally, telling stories. <clears throat> They not only provide context for what you do in certain situations, but it also motivates people to act. Now, the authors of the book tell us you can do this in three ways, uh, and, and it's kind of like plots to a story. It could be uh, David versus Goliath, something around facing insurmountable odds. Uh, it could be a connection plot, which is about bridging the gap. From a learning standpoint, you can share stories connecting the dots in terms of reducing the sales cycle time from 90 to 60 days. And, Talk about how that, how, you know, John Smith was so elevated once he figured that out. He was able to do his work more efficiently and spend more time at home <clears throat> with the family. So it's much better to reference a real story than fabricate one. So as you're teaching this, say it's in a class, online, whatever, use that story as a thread. You can apply this to, this is real good in scenario-based learning. Or you could write a post on Connect telling the story. Effective storytelling provides context and most importantly, stickiness. It compels people to ask. Still wondering about the popcorn story? I get to it. So in summary, at the beginning of the webinar, I talked about how the world is shifting away from learning management to learning uh, more of a learning experience and how important or how informal learning and collaboration are key to this. Then I talked about the stickiness and how you want to apply that success principle to your learning strategy. And then finally, we talked about how to move from your current state to a desired state and how learning influences all the elements of talent management. We talked about the three steps to take to move to a better learning experience. Diagnose your current learning strategy and content, identify the gaps, and, some, and we talked about some ideas on how to solve those gaps. And we talked about how content and community play new roles in the learning platform era um, that affect the learner's experience. Hopefully that was your takeaways. So you are probably wondering, uh, Arts, back to the popcorn story, Arts messaging actually resulted in new behavior. People stopped buying as much popcorn. But the theaters wanted that money back, so the big players really didn't change as you can see in these, in these three examples. Well, the Center for Science and Public Interest took Art's message a step further to the world using one of their articles. And in it, they do make mention that popcorn, when you don't use cooking oil and you air pop it, is probably one of the healthiest foods you can have, but that's not what you get in the theater. So was Art successful? To some extent, he was. Word had gotten out that theater popcorn was not a healthy food, and people are buying less of it. The bad news is that two of the largest theater chains haven't changed anything, unfortunately. But the good news is that Cinemark has done something about it. They changed to canola oil, from coconut to canola oil. And this, it still has bad stuff, but it's a move in the right direction. I did a little more research on the subject this morning. Obviously, uh, uh, the movie title itself is the real draw, but theaters are uh, are reluctant to change their concessions because you know they make 85% profit at the concession stand. So way to go, Cinemark. And I sure do hope others, others will follow. Well, look, I, I hope you found this to be informative, folks. I sure appreciate your time. Um, by the way, uh, we will be publishing our points of view via blogs uh, on Gladwell's three themes and from his Tipping Point book. And it'll start with The Power of Context. Dr. Tom Tonkin from our team will be publishing that blog soon. Then we'll add on the law of the few and the stickiness factor. So stay tuned to Cornerstone's Rework blog site. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time and good day. Okay, I'm done. <laughs>